Amen. There's a place for me in my father's house. I love that. I've had a week. I don't know about you. I've had a week. And most of the week came on one day. Came on one day. That was, that was not a treat. That was not a treat. Our mission statement that says growing in faith, living in hope, and serving in love. You saw I looked up for that. I'm still getting two of them mixed up. This week, I had the opportunity to see all of those three things at work, okay? And not perfectly. And not perfectly, uh, especially, well, let me say, I was not perfect. I was not perfect in receiving them. And um, so I'll just go ahead and share with you this part. I was not perfect in faith because I was like, and because I'm growing in faith, because I was like waiting or trusting myself instead of trusting God in some situations. Okay. I was not perfect in hope. I'm just telling you what I was not perfect in. I was not perfect in hope because I was not hopeful in the situation. Although, you know, in the back, I was hopeful. But sometimes in my present mood or my present mind, the hope is not there. And then serving in love. I think I missed an opportunity. I, I, I like to think I'm good at that one. <laughs> Don't we all? And, but I missed an opportunity to serve a young person who needed to be served in love. I missed that opportunity. So before we even officially start, I want you to turn to your elbow partner or somebody at your table. Just look, look around, look around, look around, and, and you can go join the table, whatever. And I want you to say, I let them know, I'm gonna give you two minutes to do this part. Two minutes, maybe one. Might be too much. Might be too much. Two minutes seems like a lifetime, or it can just seem really short. Um, and people on Zoom land, you're either going to talk to somebody in the room with you, or you're going to be speaking to God. Okay? People in Zoom, talk to someone in the room with you, or you're going to be speaking to God. And I want you to say what word that you lived out that you think you did okay with, or that you could see God moving with that word in your life this week, and maybe even what word that you didn't do so well with, maybe even what word that you didn't, and don't go too deep, because this could take time. I just want you to recognize, I did, I did okay in this area, but I was working on this area. So really, that should take about one minute. I was okay in this area, but it's going to seem like a lifetime. All right? So y'all like, we talk every morning, Bob and Pat. So what word do you feel like you needed to grow in this week? Okay? Ready, set, go. Five, four, three, two, one. Did you see how we could... Uh, Go on with that for a minute. You might pick that up after services, I'm just saying, because <laughs> we could go on with that for a minute. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you. Lord, we just lay out ourselves before you. We lay out our needs, and Lord, we even lay out our wants, and you and your mercy and grace, you give us what we need and sometimes what we want <laughs> when it lines up with who you are. God, we're so grateful. We're grateful to be here today. We're grateful, God, that uh, you're going to speak to each one of us where we are and speak to our hearts, and let us grow in grace and knowledge and faith, hope, and love. Thank you so much as we learn to respond in ways that are pleasing to you and that represent who you are. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I'm going to start out by reading the scripture, Romans 5, verses 1 through 15, in the ESV, English Standard Version. Here we go. Verse 5. Therefore, everybody say therefore. therefore. That lets you know that something's about that has come before it, but I'm not going back to that, but you'll see what I mean in a minute. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. <laughs> I, I know y'all want to laugh sometimes at that. Knowing that our suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. 
And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For, for while we are still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Don't you love that right time? For one will scarcely, I mean, thank you. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare to even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore, say therefore, we have now been justified by his blood. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more. Now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? More than that, you get catching all those mores? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Amen. That therefore that Paul begins with, he has us looking back at something in the writing. So when you go home and you read this again, go back and see all that he was talking about before. And some of that we've gone through before. He often uses that word to look back and it's the foundation about what he's about to say. This is a good word for us because we are looking forward to people are going through Lent. We call it Easter preparation, Resurrection Sunday, whatever word you want to go with, it happened. Okay. Whatever you want to go with, that's good for us to look back. We're looking back to see where it is, how we've got to where we are. We're looking at Christ's walk as he walks up to the time when he is crucified, which makes everything true for us. It is the reason we can believe. During this season, we're encouraged to take time, look back, how God revealed himself through Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. This is where we're able to get grounded and repent. We're turning away from who we were and turning toward Jesus. Amen. We're reminded of God's faithfulness and love toward us revealed in Jesus Christ. We can turn from unfitting responses, like we've had some unfitting responses this week, as I've had. Uh, responses born out of fear, born out of guilt, to responses filled with faith, hope, and love. So that first verse said, therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's going to be three things he tells us, even in this short time. There's three things Paul's going to tell us. And it's just, it's just not faith, hope, and love. There's three things he's going to tell us. It's important to note that he says, we have already acquired them. It's not that we have to battle for it. It's not that it's not here. We already received it because of our belief through the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? The first thing is we already have justification. We are already justified. You've heard us say this many times, and isn't that hard to believe that we're already justified, that we've already been made righteous? How can this be since we so often fall again into making mistakes? Could you shut that door for me, please? Just a little bit. Okay. I don't think so. Just checking. Okay. There's a lot of people wandering through the building. Although this might be a good word. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we should leave it open. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, that instead of, yeah, you can crack it. Um, lost my train of thought. We have already been justified by faith. That means we've already been made righteous. How can this be since we so often fall into sin? And anybody can say, I didn't sin all week. Anybody? Anybody? You know, we can raise our hands and, and lie to ourselves, but God, right? Um, we're painfully aware, especially during this season of looking back. I'm painfully aware of how I fall short. Painfully aware that without Jesus, Sorry, I would not be able to make it. I would not 
we would not be able to make it. It indicates that we are not yet righteous because we know that we're sin, but we're made righteous through Jesus. So we keep thinking, getting those two mixed up, still trying to make ourselves righteous. Sorry, you won't be able to do it tomorrow. Yeah, I'm talking to myself today. So you can put your name in that place. You won't be able to do it. You're, and you don't have to. Jesus made us righteous. We're convinced that righteousness is the goal to pursue rather than the present reality that all we need to do is receive it. We don't have to pursue it. He leaves no room for potential justification. When Paul says he added a qualifier that this justification comes to us by faith. It comes by faith. Lord, increase my faith. By trusting Jesus, we receive that he already accomplished on our behalf all that is needed. And that faith is a gift. Paul tells us a second thing. As a result of justification given to us, how about this one? We have peace with God. We have peace with God. We sit up here and struggle against God. God said, what are you doing? You and me are okay. My son died for you. We're at peace with God. But we struggle. But we struggle. We don't have to pursue it. We don't have to attain it. We already have it. But this God of grace revealed in Jesus Christ, literally, he takes away our sin and our guilt. No longer do we have to feel guilty. And he also took away the ultimate consequence, which is death. Death is not the rule in our life anymore. This physical body may be gone, but death does not have us anymore. Doesn't that put things in perspective sometimes when you're like, wait a minute, I feel like this is going to be the end of it if God says, no, it's just the beginning because I got you. I've got you. It's all done through his son, Jesus Christ. He's the one who mediates our peace with God by cleansing us of our sins and clothing us in his righteousness. He's our mediator. Don't you want him in the courtroom with you? Don't you want him speaking up for you when somebody smears your name? That's who I want. That's who I want. How might this change the way we go about our lives every day? Just knowing those things. When we go about our life, we won't be expecting God to strike us down or be fearful of a God that's waiting for us to make a mistake. He's not waiting for you to make a mistake. He's not waiting for me to make a mistake because he knows we're going to make them. He's not waiting on that. And we get scared and we think, oh, he's not going to give me this because I'm not walking perfectly. Or he's not going to answer this prayer because I'm not where I should be. But Christ is where we are also. He's taking us right up to the throne, right beside the Father. As he's whispering for us, we're like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. We have an active peace, an active peace. It's an intentional peace. It's not just a ceasefire. It's a dynamic peace, an active relationship that is aimed for the good of one another, aimed for the good of one another. Sometimes you just get so mad at somebody, you want them to, I just want them to get in trouble. Lord, get them. Please, just get them. It's not how God works. It's not how God works. And thank God, because somebody else is saying, Lord, get her. <laughs> it's not how he works. Our father is concerned with our life. He's concerned with our lives, and he's also concerned with our choices, because they reflect how we trust him. They reflect how we believe in him. So when we make choices that don't reflect him, we're basically saying, I don't believe you, God. I don't believe you. But that's when we repent and say, oops, my, 
my mistake, Lord. I do believe you, but in my humanness, I fall short. He is calling us into further relationship with Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. He is not a God of neglect, so it's not like he turns his back on us. He doesn't neglect us. He is always there beside us in the struggle, out of the struggle, in the peace, on the mountaintop and in the valley. He will never leave or forsake us. In verse Two, the third thing that Paul says is we have by faith. We have by faith. Paul wants us to see that not only does Jesus bring us into life of peace with the Father, but he also brings the Father's life of grace to us. Of grace to us. And we already have it. We already have it. So we need to walk like we do, right? We're still growing in faith, still growing in faith. We've obtained grace in such a way that it can be said that we stand on it. We stand on it. Seen that commercial where the people stand on the windows? We not only stand behind our windows, we stand on it. I know some people don't get commercials anymore. They just watch their TV. I know, you skip them. But we stand on it. Stand on that grace. Stand on that promise. It's not going to break. It's not going to swallow you up. You're not going to fall through a big old hole. Okay? Our standing with the Father is secured by his grace. secured by his grace. I think sometimes we think we're on a zip line and it's going to let go. Can this thing hold me? Can this thing hold me? God's grace is not some exception or a past, but rather a committed and determined will to bring us fully into the righteous life he has for us. Not a pass, not an exception, not an exception. And Paul says, He has more to say about it because he says we're rejoicing in our hope, rejoicing in our hope. He doesn't divorce the glory of God from the glory revealed on the cross, the glory of God and the glory of the cross. Because of what Christ has done on the cross, even though our sufferings now serve a good purpose, as my friend Carmela is waiting for her daughter to come out of surgery right now. You know, she says they're they're in her room. Um, she's been in surgery probably an hour and a half now, and they are pr- uh, playing praise music. They brought in a little speaker and they're playing it in her room. I said, y'all keep that up. I said, let us know when she gets out of surgery. Y'all keep that up. But the way that God worked out our sufferings, I've just got to share this with you. And I said I would. Her daughter came down to live with her. And I stayed with her for a few months. And I told Carmel I was going to share this, so this is okay. And because she's been sick up in Chicago, but she's kind of been on her, you know, her sister was up there and everything. So she's kind of been by herself. But here's what God did. So we think Taylor's just coming down. Taylor's coming down and just to be with um, Carmela so that Carmela can keep an eye on her. But Taylor got really sick and she's being operated on right now. And so in this sickness, the hospital she went to is the very hospital where Carmela works as a project manager. So while she's in the hospital, Carmela can be, you know, she's focusing on Taylor, but it, for any reason, and her job seems to understand. So she's in the very hospital where Carmela works. Not only that, but just a week ago before Taylor went into the hospital, or a few days ago before she went in, her Carmela's sister, her brother-in-law, and her other daughter come to visit And now they are there to sit in the room with Carmela as she waits. God is so intentional. So intentional. I said, Carmela, you better recognize he knew you were going to need the support. And he brought your family for a visit as they sit with you. Praise God. He's not playing. He's not playing. We better recognize. For Christians, we know that all our suffering, no matter how small or how large, 
is assumed into Christ's sufferings. Because of this, we're assured that our suffering is not senseless. And you can feel that sometimes. Lord, why? This is too much. It's not senseless. I've got you, he says. Our sufferings are never a waste of occurrence in our life. God has employed them into his work of bringing us to share in his own glory. He's brought it all together as part of his glory. Paul's um, not done talking about hope. And he says, this hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us does not put us to shame. You know, you have people like, you think about Job and his friends saying, just yeah, his wife too, curse God and die. People thought that was just a flip remark from her. My thought was she hated seeing her husband suffer. She hated seeing that. Just curse God and die. I can't watch you like this anymore. And sometimes you can be in that much pain. God, just, just end it. Just end it. And unless you've never been there, you don't know what I'm talking about. But I know people who've been there. And sometimes I felt like I was there. But you know what you find out? Just on the other side, there's, the, there, there's God. Just, just, he's been with you, but you can't see him because the storm is so great. You cannot see him. And you're just blinded by the, you know, they said that people have died in a snowstorm when they were just six feet from the door because they couldn't see where the door was. So they're just reaching and they couldn't see it. And they just had a little, a little, little bit to go, but they give up. That's exactly what the enemy would have you do. He wants you to give up. He wants you to say, I think I said this in the beginning, I'm not good enough. I can't do this. What you've given me to do is too big for me. I am not qualified. Of course, you're not qualified. He qualifies us. He calls you, then he qualifies you for it. He calls you to it, and he qualifies you for it. And I have seen that in my own life. So unqualified to stand up here and be a pastor. But he's called me to it, and he's continually equipping, equipping for the purpose, equipping us, okay? During this season, we repent, we turn away from the distorted uh, attempts of our love and that do not flow from God. But we, we need to be turning toward the love that does flow for him, from him. We don't need to manufacture our signal our own love to the world. We just need to show God's love to the world. We don't need to make it up. Muster it up. The Father's love is not kept at a distance for us to try and emulate. It is within us. Within us. Now, Paul turns our attention to the cross for a fuller revelation of God's love because Jesus went all the way to the cross. And the Father sent him to do that. Paul, Paul's showing us the extreme radical love of God. Radical love. This is not a love that comes to the deserving and to the lovable. It's very easy to love um, even as a, I'll say this, you love all children, but the ones who are really nice, isn't it easy to love them? And the ones who are naughty, you're like, oh. <laughs> Why can't you be like this child? You know, if I had a classroom full of angels, I would never grow. They would be perfect. I have a student that I tell my students about, and his, I told you, Jeremy. You're not Jeremy. If you want me, if you, want, if you need to go to the restroom, you need to do this. Why aren't you listening to me? This is how you get favors out of me. Thank God God isn't like that. 
I need to straighten up because God is not like that. He is merciful. Okay, go to the restroom. Okay, go get a drink of water. You as bad as what? <laughs> I'm sh I shouldn't say bad. You're as naughty as what? You go ahead. God just pours out his love to us. We're not deserving. He captures it with the word weak, ungodly, and sinners. Not only are we ungodly sinners, but we're even too weak to do anything about it. I can't even do anything about it, Lord. But now we return to his opening statement, and then he uses the terms. You see it over and over again when we were reading in the beginning. Much more, more than this, because that's who God is, a God of much more. It's not just this. It's much more than this. And then he continues to pour that out. He said, we're justified by faith. And then he says, we have now been justified by his blood. So that is more. He's giving us that assurance. He says much more again to come to the basis of justification we now have. We're complete. We're saved from the wrath of God. We're saved from it. The Father was not going to let sin have the final word over us. Sin does not have the final word over us. Aren't you glad about that? He sent his own son, the word of God, to speak the final word. It is finished. He spoke those words from the cross. It is finished. He didn't say, now you keep going and keep trying. It's done. It's done. Paul still has much more to say. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more now, we are reconciled and shall be saved by his life. So he speaks of the reconciliation, bringing us into, connected to God. And that is a truth. And that was while we were still enemies. So how does he feel about you now? He didn't save us from something but he saved us for something, righteousness and life. And that life is available to us. And then he has one final thing to say, because he says, more than that, more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So our justification and reconciliation, the righteous life of knowing the Father through the Son, by the Spirit, given to us by grace, is a life of great joy. So we don't have to walk around with our heads hung low. Although sometimes we feel like it. I just need people to remind me, head up, sis. Head up. You are not defeated. We don't walk around in defeat. We are brought into righteousness. We are brought into the righteous life of God to rejoice. We are assured that the life we are given in Jesus will not disappoint. We will not be disappointed and we will not be put to shame. And others may try to make you feel that way, but you know who that's of because he can't stand the fact that you understand you got nothing on me. You have already been defeated. My God has me. And start speaking those words over your situation. I will not fear. God has me. I will not fear. Jesus died for me. I will not fear. I am complete. I am enough. I can get this done. I will not fear. Checkbook says one thing, but God says the other. I will not fear. I know who I am. I know who I am. Amen. As we come to know the Father, as Jesus knows the Father, we will come to share in Jesus' joy of knowing the Father. That brings a smile to my face. In other words, we have much more to look forward to, much more to look forward to, much more to hope, much more to have hope much more serving in love to do, much more growing in faith. Even now in the present, as we come to know the Father, we grow in our responses of faith, hope, 
and love. We come to see more and more of the goodness of God and, rich, and how richly blessed we are to belong to him. Amen. We are indeed richly blessed. So what is our response? Our response is communion. Our response is, Lord, we believe. We believe in my Father's house. There's a place for me. Thank you. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Thank you. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Mm. I'm going to keep singing that. You ever had a, the earworm in your head that you wake up in the middle of the night? And, in my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Let me tell you, as we take communion and we take it in community with one another, we recognize that there are people who have no idea what we're talking about. No idea that in your struggle in the hospital room, you can play praise music and it could be joyful and you can praise God through that time of waiting. People who have no idea. You just got let go of a job, but you're not worried. You know the other job is around the corner. The people who have no idea that as you wait for a house to sell or you wait to move in to a new house, your understanding is, God, I'm just waiting to see where you got me going. Where am I going to be going? Because your timing is perfect and your yoke is easy. Help my unbelief, Lord. Anything you need to address with the Lord, do so right now. Anything that you feel like he needs to know, God, I get it. And I turn back to you. Take a moment and do that right now. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. And that word seems so small. We are so grateful, God. We are so grateful that in all this, you see us. That in all this, you walk with us. Not only do you walk with us, you live in us, Lord. We are justified. We are brought into faith. The faith through Jesus Christ. We are given hope and we can rejoice in that. Everything that is in Jesus is in us. Help us to recognize it, Lord. As we take this communion, we say, Lord, we recognize that it comes from you. We don't have to muster it up. We don't have to walk in it perfectly, but we don't walk in it with a lack attitude, Lord. We walk in it with a determined attitude of, God, help us to see it in our imperfections. The love that you have for us that's beyond what we can comprehend. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we glorify your name. Lord, we thank you for your goodness, for you are a good God. And as we take this, bless this communion. Bless this communion, Lord. Every time we hear a word from you, help us to be changed for the better. Help us to walk out different than when we came in for the better. Help us to walk out stronger. Strengthen us through this. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you're doing. And we're thankful, Lord, for what you will do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The body of Christ.